Today in worship, we are responding to what are called royal psalms. Uh, these are psalms that celebrate the blessing of God on the king of Israel and also celebrating the blessing that the king brings to his people. Uh, in a sense, the royal psalms also kind of look the other direction. They look to the ultimate king, the one who uh, establishes the king of Israel, who is often called God's son. Uh, but it, it's directed to look over and, and above to see God, uh, the authority and benevolence of this, this great king of kings. And as you might expect, uh, there, there's kind of method to my madness in ramping up our exploration of the Psalms of these royal Psalms because of the birth of the ideal perfect king who is Jesus. And so uh, this morning we're going to be ranging a little bit beyond the Psalms. We're going to be reading some of the royal Psalms. We're going to be meditating on some other readings of Scripture that develop the idea of King Jesus, who Jesus is as king and what that means for us. And we began with a reading out of Psalm 144. I will sing a new song to you, my God. On the ten-stringed lyre, I will make music to you, to the one who gives victory to kings, who delivers his servant David from the deadly sword. Deliver me, rescue me from the hands of foreigners whose mouths are full of lies and whose right hands are deceitful. Then our sons in their youth will be like well-nurtured plants, and our daughters will be like pillars carved to adorn a palace. Our barns will be filled with every kind of provision. Our sheep will increase by thousands, by tens of thousands in their fields. Our oxen will draw heavy loads. There will be no breaching of walls, no going into captivity, no cry of distress in our streets. Blessed is the people of whom this is true. Blessed is the people whose God is Yahweh. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And Isaiah ends his prophecy with this statement, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. With the pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. As we read Psalm 72, I want you to be thinking about Jesus because the information in these psalms, the way these psalms are written, really points toward the ideal king. And so I want you to be thinking about what it is that Jesus is in God's mind as we read this psalm. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills, the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. 
May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. May he be like rain falling from a, on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and prosperity abound till the moon is no more. May he rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of distant shores bring tribute to him. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring him gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence for precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live. May gold from Sheba be given him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. May grain abound throughout the land. On the tops of the hills may it sway. May the crops flourish like Lebanon and thrive like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. Then all nations will be blessed through him and they will call him blessed. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he's been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle. Arrayed in holy splendor, your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift his head high. <clears throat> 
Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you're my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You'll break, them in, uh, you'll break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Doesn't that sound like Matthew chapter 2? The Magi come riding into town. I don't know what they look like, whether they were dressed funny or whether they were dressed like foreigners or what even they were riding, but the Magi are some kind of a class of sky watchers and they keep an eye on the heavens and they have seen something in the heavens, planetary conjunction, uh, a comet showing up against the background of some particular constellation. Maybe they've seen a brand new star. But at any rate, there is something that, that catches their attention and connects them to Balaam's prophecy in Numbers. That prophecy says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. And these Magi show up, they are convinced that they have seen a heavenly announcement of the birth of the king of the Jews. As a matter of fact, they are convinced more than that. They are convinced that the Messiah himself has been born. This, this legendary figure, this prophesied figure who would, who would appear and bring Israel out of her darkness, would establish freedom for all time, would establish righteousness for all time would make sure that Israel is exactly what God intended for it to be when he called them out of, of Egypt in the first place. And of course, if you're going to be looking for the king of the Jews, if you're going to be looking for this Messiah, the logical place to look for him is on God's holy mountain, Zion. And so they show up in Jerusalem. Herod, the king, panics. After all, Herod imagines himself to be the Messiah. That's one of the reasons he is so proud of being king, and that's why he's so particular about uh, anybody usurping his, uh, his kingship or his authority because I am supposed to be the one who is going to be God's chosen one, who's going to lead God's people out of their wilderness. Certainly, Herod didn't want to get some revolutionary movement started among his, in his kingdom and among his people. And so he, he's got to hear this announcement of the Magi that this special king, the son of David, has been born He's got to really be upset about this and, and panicked about this. He immediately turns to the scribes to hear from them where the Messiah was to be born. And he's told Bethlehem. That comes straight out of the prophet Micah. And so then, pretending to be caught up in this joy over the fulfillment of God's promise to Israel of freedom through the forgiveness of sin, Herod sends the Magi to Bethlehem. Go and search carefully for the child, he says. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. And of course, we know that what his intention is, is to murder this child and be rid of all this business about competing messiahs. I mean, I am it. I'm going to be the one who remains. Why? Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up, the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And you might know that, by the way, in verse 2 that says in Hebrew, the kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against Yahweh and against his Messiah. In Greek, it's the kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against Yahweh and against his Christ. The Magi then find the child 
And they find him in Bethlehem, of course, because this is what was foretold by God through Micah the prophet. And this child is indeed truly the Messiah, the Christ. And so these Magi worship him, and they give him the gifts worthy of a king. And then Herod is foiled. He is outsmarted. He's overcome. He's overpowered, whatever you want to call it. Herod, all of his plans are ruined because God warns the Magi in a dream to return home without telling Herod where the child is. And then Joseph is warned in a dream, grab up this child, take your family, go to Egypt. And then in verse 15, there is a really understated note. Matthew 2, I don't have it up here on the screen. But Matthew 2 and verse 15 says, where he stayed until the death of Herod. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son, and I will proclaim the Lord's decree. You are my, he said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Here is God working to, to when Herod is trying to outsmart God or throw off his chains, rule for himself, God said, no, I'm having none of that. Of course, in the tragic process of the story, in the progress of the story, Herod, really furious, and being the murderous, ruthless king he is, orders that all male babies under the age of two be killed. And don't you get the irony of that? In his desperation to be God's king, that's what he thinks he's doing. He is assuring his role as Messiah. But in trying to be God's king, he winds up being the Pharaoh of the Exodus who orders all of the male children of the Israelites to be killed. And he falls under the derision of the Lord. Now, I, I don't want to downplay the, down, the, the tragedy of these murders for the mothers of Bethlehem, but I, I think we often miss the point of this story by, by getting all caught up in what the horrible thing that's happened here and identifying with the mothers and hearing their crying and, and worrying. And we think, why in the world, God, would you send your son into the world in a way like this that, that would cause all of this trouble and all of, this, all of the death of these un innocent babies? The answer to that, of course, is that's the way evil treats all the innocents all the time. Gee, I sent my son into the world, and what happened? Well, Jesus, the innocent one, will die on the cross. The kings of the earth rise up, and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. And again, then we have this recorded by Matthew, after Herod died, I'm not sure I had that up there, after Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Egypt, uh, the land of Israel for those who were trying to take the child's life or dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. The Lord laughs in derision, not as though he is laughing at an episode of I Love Lucy, you know, where Lucy and her friends are always doing something ludicrous and they get themselves in some silly situation and they make all the wrong choices and do all the wrong things and we just sit and laugh at how goofy they are. It's not as though Herod and his minions are kind of tumbling around the screen like Keystone cops. And Yahweh is just laughing, you know, tears coming down his face because he's just looking at the comedy of all that's going. No, this is, this is derisive laughter. This is serious laughter. The sort, of, the, 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 the sort of angry snort of the one who is amazed that mere human beings who think that they are gods can overthrow him and his ruler. These, 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 these mere puny humans who think that they can, by their amazing power, undo the work of God. His people are in slavery in Egypt, and there's this powerful Pharaoh who thinks that he can command the death of every male child. And God says, I'm going to take one of those male children and raise up Moses. And through him, he will overthrow Pharaoh and win freedom for my people. Herod thinks that he can somehow take control of the promises of God and he will kill the true Messiah so that he 
Herod can be Christ. And the Lord laughs. And this time, he sends his son into Egypt and then brings him home after Herod has, what? This sort of faded away into insignificance, raging and sputtering and screaming and, and, and fighting his way all the way into hell. I will, the psalmist says, proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you're my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. And that's really the story we celebrate by what we call Christmas. You know, Yahweh setting his son up as the high king, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, who will, who will rescue God's people and he will rescue God's world from their enemies. And it won't be through blood and smoke and murder and throwing his weight around like those earthly kings who think that they can all band together and get their power in, a, in, in line and they can throw off God's chains and rule for themselves. But this king will conquer by love and by faithfulness and forgiveness and ultimately by resurrection, this king will bring eternal life. Therefore, therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. You know, the good news, the gospel always ends in an invitation. It always ends in a call to recognize the authority and the goodness of God and to bow before the Son, kiss the Son, sing the psalmist. And we, you know, I, you, you're five or six or seven years old and you think, kiss the Son, ew, nobody wants to do that. The idea of kissing the Son is not a romantic statement, obviously, but it's a gesture of submission before the majesty of this righteous, righteous chosen one. In New Testament terms, it means to confess the name of Jesus as Lord, as King, and be, being baptized into his name. And, and by that, you accept his leadership, you accept his rule over your life. And so we're singing this invitation song. And if you need to come to Jesus this morning, the great King, would you come while we're singing? Let's stand, please.